about in this hour. Peace, how to find peace. Most of us would rather find worry than peace. Turn in your Bibles to Philippians, the fourth chapter, as we continue our brief journey through the small epistle, the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Philippi. Philippians, the fourth chapter, we'll be looking at verses 6, 7, 8, and 9. Uh, one of the verses, in fact, verse uh, 6 is one that most are familiar with, but most of the time we pluck it out of context to teach a different message or different lesson very briefly. But we're looking at the unit of thought in verses 6, 7, 8, and 9. And as we look at the text, our subject is talking about how to find peace, how to find peace. Let me just give a little small introduction to this text that will set the stage for where we're going and what we want to talk about in these moments together. Today in the world in which we're living in, I believe that we have more people that are worried than ever in the history of our nation, as I perceive it. Worry. We're talking about things today that we've never talked about before that, generally speaking, brings about the consternation, concern, anxiety, and worry that uh, perhaps you have not considered to be that. But we are looking at the COVID-19, for example, the fears. Just on the afternoon's news, on the Communist Network news, they're uh, re-addressing uh, the question of COVID and talking about how dire and difficult and deadly it is. And there's supposed to be a new strain now of COVID in India that's causing uh, major, major calamity. And uh, Dr. Fauci said in the interview this afternoon on the Communist Network news, uh, Dr. Fauci said that he could not say for sure that we'd ever be able to stop lockdowns or that we'd ever be able to get out of the mask wearings, uh, that he, he just simply doesn't want to make that commitment because there's no way to know for sure. So it keeps people in the state of consternation and fear and worry. The lockdowns, the mask mandates, uh, the job, the work, the employment, our children's education. Our, most of our kids have been out of school now uh, for over a year and uh, how that will be made up for especially the 10th, 11th, and 12th graders, how they'll ever make that up. A multitude of our students had already had the potentiality of scholarships for college and then missed the last year in school. Many of them, according to the statistical research on that, will never go back to school and perhaps will never enter college. And that may be a good thing, by the way, of staying out of the secular colleges. But nevertheless, it's a lot of things that a lot of people are, post, uh, are uh, prone to worry about. Uh, the uh, evidence that we have today and the circumstances that's in our world are changing at what I call an alarming rate. What you might not be concerned about today, you will be tomorrow. Why is that so? Because Joe Biden is supposed to speak either tomorrow or Tuesday, and he's supposed to tell the nation about how wonderful things are. And I don't know about you, but I don't have a whole lot of confidence in his speech and what will be said in relationship to that. But nevertheless, it will bring about consternation, concern, anxiety, and worry on the part of multitudes. Well, watch what is taking place on the southern border. It can't help but to cause us to be concerned and anxious over that. Half a million has already entered this year uh, through the southern border that are not supposed to be here. Uh, they are being uh, transported to all parts of America and dumped in the cities. And uh, major, major, major consternation, worry, anxiety, and fear over that. Well, some of the major things in the secular realm, but we also have those in the realm of the spiritual, if you will. A lot of people are worried about what can I do to please Jesus, wanting to work and work and work, rather than recognizing that once we've said yes to Jesus, everything's in his hands, he would simply have us to be obedient each and every day in serving him. So as we look at these things taking place at a, an alarming rate in our nation, what will we worry about next? What will be the next thing on the horizon that will bring about worry and fret and anxiety? But may I say to you, worry indicates a lack, L-A-C-K, of faith. Worry is the next door neighbor of fear. And fear is not what God will have us to be. He's not given us the spirit of fear according to the Scripture. So in this text, I want us to look at how to find peace how to find peace. There are three things, four things in particular that I want us to notice as we think on the subject. How to find peace. The prerequisite of uh, peace revealed. The prescription of peace recorded. The promise of peace reminded. And the program of peace reviewed. Stand, if you will, please, out of honor and recognition of the reading of the word. As I read audibly, follow with me in your scripture silently. Philippians, the fourth chapter, verse 6, 7, 8, and 9. 
Be careful for nothing but in everything by peer, uh, prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Amen. Thank you, and we may be seated. The prerequisite of peace revealed in that sixth verse. Notice, first of all, the problem that's considered, the problem considered. Now, I know that you've never worried. I understand that we never have a reason for worry. But the Scripture says in that sixth verse, be careful, be careful. That word careful means to be worried, to be anxious, to be fretting for nothing. Be careful for nothing. Don't fret, don't worry about anything, any little thing, any big thing. Anything that comes across your path, we're not to be worried about it. Be careful. That means to be worried, anxious, and fretting. Some people say, well, you know, this is a small thing. I can handle it. The big things, I'll let God handle them. No, he can handle all of them, whether it be big or little. God is pos uh, uh, has the power to handle all of those things. The problem is not just get, considering the situation, not just surveying the circumstances, uh, not just looking at it, but this word here suggests brooding and constant pondering over the situation or the problem. Someone said, and may I quote, worry is wasting today's time to clutter up tomorrow's opportunities with yesterday's troubles. You got that, didn't you? <laughs> That's exactly what takes place so often when we worry. And the best of us will usually say, well, I'm not going to let that worry me. And 15 minutes later, you take it up and start cudgeling it again and somehow, some way, think that you can wrestle it to the ground and resolve it. I don't know if you've ever had that to happen. I have. And I understand that oftentimes we think that worry is something not going to bother me. And I say to people, I get up in the morning and say, thank you, Lord, for waking me up. I go through the day acting like I've got good sense and go to bed at night saying, thank you, Lord, for letting me live today. And it, no, there's no point in worrying about what we cannot handle or take care of. Worrying is trying to resolve your own problems, and it causes illnesses, disease, death, and uh, major, major physical problems when one constantly worries. Perhaps, you, perhaps you've heard the little story of the man with the little boy is getting on a crowded bus and the fare is supposed to be only for those that are uh, 12 years old and younger, no fare. And he gets on the bus and uh, the bus uh, driver says, where's the fare for your boy? And he says, why? He's just three years old. The driver said, well, he sure looks 12 to me. And the father says, well, I can't help it if he worries all the time. <laughs> The worry will put age on you is the mindset and the little pun point that is made there. And many times we do not recognize what it's doing to our health when we want to worry. But the scripture, the prerequisite, is looking at the problem that's considered. Be careful for nothing. Don't be worried. Don't be anxious. Don't be fretting for anything, for not anything, little thing, a big thing. Our major problem is that we have plans and we carry out our plans and our, uh, we prepare for those plans and we prepare for the future and what we wanted to accomplish, what we're wanting to do. But we are often worried about those problems and situations. Many times the problems and situations that we worry about, we brought upon ourselves because we're not dependent upon the Lord and allowing God to direct us and what he'd have us to do. Wanting to make our own decisions, going our own way, doing our own thing without asking God, God, what would you have me to do? Where would you have me to go? How would you have me to spend my money? How would you have me to invest my time? And time ought to be invested in the work of the Lord in serving Him and through His kingdom. Not only do we see then the problem considered, but notice the precaution commanded. Be careful for nothing that's anxious, worried for nothing. That is, don't worry, don't be fretful. It is in the imperative voice. It is a command that we're not to worry, that we're not to be fretful, we're not to be anxious over anything. To care, to be concerned about something is one thing, but to worry is another. The Apostle Paul is saying here, don't you dare worry. Don't worry about anything, any little thing, any big thing. Don't worry. 
People worry about the finances. People worry about the family. People worry about friends and the future and the failure, the potentiality. We worry about each election cycle. We wonder what's going to take place in the battleground states today. And I'm not worried about it, but I'm keeping good close tabs on what's taking place in those five states. They're recounting votes with uh, a forensic audit of some of the votes in Arizona, 2.1 million being counted. And yet there are attorneys by the battery of attorneys out in each of those battleground states trying to prevent the recount. What are they worried about? It's being paid for by the Communist Network News uh, and the Democratic Party uh, to try to prevent the recount. What are they worried about? What are they concerned about? But from the standpoint of we, the people, the citizens, and especially as Christians, we ought to be worried. I'm looking forward to the day that they announce that there's uh, hundreds of thousands of false votes. They've already determined that in Arizona. They're determining that in Georgia. They're looking at that in Wisconsin. They've already determined that in uh, Pennsylvania. But the uh, appeals court judge, the federal judges in Pennsylvania, refused to allow it to be heard, even though they'd proven that there were absolute fraudulent votes in that state. But let me say to you, I'm not worried because God is still on the throne. God is still in control. God is still in charge of what is taking place. So I'm not worried about it. That's the precaution that is commanded there. Jesus, if you recall, in, Mar in Luke's Gospel, the 10th chapter and the 41st verse, Jesus cautioned Martha about worry. He, G and Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art, thou art careful, worried, anxious, troubled, perplexed about many things. There is the difficulty and the problem that we're faced with today. Did you know, according to those that research these things, 90% of the things we worry about never take place. Worried about this happening, that happening, the other. There are a ton of people today that will go to work tomorrow worried about their job, worried about the income, worried about the family, worried about meeting the needs, etc., etc. And the Scripture is very, very clear. Be careful. Be anxious. Don't be worried about anything. Regardless of what it may be, we're not to worry. In John 14, 1, Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Our focus ought to be off self and on the Savior. Our focus ought to be not on what we can do, but what God can do through us as we're yielded to his will in our lives in serving him in a submission of heart and life. Worry is interest on the debt of a interest on a debt of unbelief. And may I say to you that many times we worry, and the Scripture is very clear that we ought not to. Someone has said that that worry is that interest on the debt that may never come due. Pretty powerful statement when you analyze it in light of the Scripture. Not only do we see the prerequisite for peace revealed, but notice secondly in verse 6, the latter portion, the prescription for peace recorded. What's the cure? What's the answer? What is the prescription for worry? How should we respond to that potentiality of worry? Notice the priority commended. But in everything, but is a contrast. But is a transition of thought. But is going from one position to another position. It is making a transition here from the worry to the transition of not to worry. But in everything, each and everything, every little thing, every big thing, let your request be made known unto God. And the word led is in the continuing voice. Keep on letting your request be made known to the Lord. That is the prerequisite and the prescription that we find here. There's an old song that says, What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. And I believe we fail to recognize that. I believe most of the time, most of us as individuals, even as believers, we'd rather, rather wring our hands and twist our hands and be in anxious, anxiety and worry and try to wrestle with that problem rather than just simply saying, Lord, here's the problem. Here's what I'm faced with. You handle it. You take care of it. The scripture is very, very clear. But in everything, let your request be made known unto the Lord. First Peter chapter 5, verse 7 says, Casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. I found that the Lord can handle these problems better than I can. I found that the Lord can take care of them more readily than I can. And I have found and I'm finding more and more every day as uh, the dark hairs turn to light hairs. 
Every day as we get older, especially as Christians and we meditate in the Word, we're more prone, I believe, to simply recognize that God is always taking care of the problems. God always shall. And we need to recognize that He is the one that we need to turn to. And in everything, by prayer and supplication, the Scripture says, in everything, let your request be made known unto God. The Lord can handle it. We must remember, as what we find in the Scripture is very, very applicable in this sense. The Scripture says in Romans 8, 28, the Scripture says, And we know that all things work together for good. didn't say all things are good, but work together for good. Kelos, work together for being that which is honorable before God to them that love God, to them that are the called according kata, based upon His purpose. He calls us and he has a purpose for our service and surrender. By the way, that text is not talking about salvation. It's talking about after salvation, that we know that everything's worked together for good to them that's called according to his purpose. And his purpose is for our lives to be sold out and surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That's God's plan. That's God's purpose for our lives. And I believe that more often than not, when we find ourselves in a position of anxiety and worry and fretting over something, it's because we've gotten off track for where God would have us to be, not doing what God has called us to do, not being in the center of his will. And as a result of that, that uh, internal me and that internal you, that real me and that real you, that spirit man within us is whispering and saying, this is not the right track, this is not the right path, this is not what you need to be doing, and therefore it sets in and causes that consternation, concern, anxiety, and worry in our lives. And the scripture is clear that we ought not to worry. We must remember what the scripture says. How do we take our cares and concerns and anxieties to the Lord? Not only do we see the priority commended, but I want you to notice the procedure chronicled in this text. By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. How do we resolve these issues? How do we resolve the problem of overly being, overly, uh, cons over, overly being concerned, the anxiety of what would be reduced to the little small word of worry? How do we resolve that? It is very, very clear the procedure that's chronicled here in the text. There's an old song that says, Are you weary? Are you heavy laden? Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. Are you grieving over joys departed? Tell it to Jesus alone. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus. He's a friend that's well known. You've no other such friend or brother. Tell it to Jesus. Tell it to Jesus alone. And that's what we need to do. We need to take that burden, that problem, that anxiety, that uh, situation that we're concerned about and wrestling with and worried over. We need to take it to the Lord. So I want us to notice three things with the procedure that's chronicled here. There's the prayer, there's the petition, and there's the praise. That's the threefold answer in this text that is given to us as to what I would call the procedure that's chronicled that we might be able to rid ourselves of the worry and recognize and find the peace that passes all understanding. Worry displaces peace. The two cannot uh, coexist. Worry replaces peace or vice versa. First of all, notice the uh, situation or the call for prayer there. It comes from the word that emphasizes prayer as an act of worship. Prayer is an act of worship. Our approach to God, coming before Him, falling, if you please, on our face in worship and adoration, and coming before Him in prayer, and going with him, to Him with that which is on our hearts, that which is burdening, and that which we need to release and turn over to Him. I've asked the question, how often do we miss God's peace? Because we fail to follow God's plan in prayer. How often do we miss the peace? Because we fail to follow God's plan our prayer in our lives. Someone said in the research on the subject that the average Christian spends less than three minutes a day in actual conscious prayer. Prayer is a position and a sense of worship before the throne of God. Have you ever tried to pray any length of time? You'll fall asleep or the doorbell will ring or somebody will knock on the door or someone will have an urgent problem they've got to ask or get resolved. That's because Satan does not want us to be in that time of prayer, in that commitment of worship, even in that little brief moment that often we spend in that time of prayer before the Lord. It is prayer. And someone asked the question several years ago when I was teaching this text in the classroom level. They asked the question, what's the difference in prayer and supplication? Notice the scripture says, by prayer and supplication. 
What's the difference in supplication and prayer? They're very, very close to being the same thing, but prayer is that worship, that emphasizing, emphasizing the act of worship before the Lord, where we're on our knees, not necessarily physically, but in our heart, on our knees before the Lord. We're worshiping Him, and it's not prayer saying, God, give me this, God, give me that, God, handle this, God, take care of that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Most of the prayer with most Christians today is gimme, 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 gimme. If I can use that little term, gimme, 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 gimme. That's most of the time what we're doing praying. And that's not what prayer is about. Prayer is simply going before God and acknowledging Him as Lord, acknowledging Him as Master, acknowledging Him as owner and controller of this universe, and recognizing His power and His authority in our lives. In that time of prayer, worship before the Lord, we are in that position of allowing God to speak to us about the issues that we're faced with. Petition simply means supplication. It's a cry for a personal need, an earnest request. It's an entreaty, and it pictures the petitioner as the subject who comes humbly before the Lord with a need that must be met. That's the difference in prayer and petition. Prayer is simply praising God and thanking God and seeing who He is and praising Him for who He is and worshiping Him. And that petition is making our personal petitions and requests known unto Him. Most of the time we skip the prayer and go straight to the petition, God give me this and God give me that and God give me the other. And then mixed with that inextricably linked is praise. Notice the scripture says, with thanksgiving. We go before the Lord in our prayer with our petitions and we then say, God, thank you, thank you, thank you. I praise you for who you are. I praise you for your being uh, king and uh, king of kings and Lord of lords. I praise you for being the master of the universe. I praise you for being in control of all that's said and done in my life. I praise you for the privilege of worshiping you, etc., etc., etc. I praise you for it and I thank you in advance for your answer to this prayer. He usually has the potential of one out of three answers. Yes, no, or wait a while. <laughs> and most of the time we want an immediate answer. We want to be able to get that quick answer. We want it done now. Psalms 103 verse 2 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Praise and thanksgiving should be a significant part of our prayer and our petition as we go before the Lord. How would you feel as a parent if your child came to you on a constant basis and asked you for something but never said, thank you, Mama, thank you, Daddy, for what you've done? How would we feel? And yet that so often is what we do as a child of God. We ask Him for things, we make a petition, we praise Him and thank Him, but we rarely, 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 after the event, after it has taken place, we rarely come back and say, thank you, Lord, for doing this. Thank you for taking care of this. But it ought to be done at the moment that we make the petition and the prayer. Is saying thank you in advance for whatever you do, for whatever you say is sufficient. You remember the Lord Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was facing the cruel cross of the next day? He was praying and he prayed and in his humanity he was saying, Lord, if it's possible, I'll have this cup to pass from me. In his humanity he saw the uh, absolute pain and agony that he would go through hanging on Mount Calvary. But he said, not my will, but thy will be done. It's a matter, as we pray, of submitting our will to the will of God, and it's then that there's the peace that passes all understanding in your life and in my life. Not only do we see the prerequisite of peace revealed and the prescription for peace recorded, but I want you to notice the promise for peace reminded in verse 7. Notice the peace committed in the Scripture the peace that is committed in the Scripture, and the peace, that means serenity, quietness of God, which passeth, and the word literally means that surpasses. It transcends, it goes beyond all understanding. An individual can be in the midst of a storm from the human standpoint. An individual can be in the midst of a problem and yet be in a total sense of absolute peace and tranquility that the world cannot understand. And the scripture here says, and the peace, serenity, the quietness of God, which surpasses, transcends, goes beyond all understanding. Peace means freedom from anxiety. Peace means the freedom from worry. Peace means rest and contentment and quietness in the heart. There still may be that storm 
But there's the peace. You remember in Mark's Gospel, the fourth chapter, verse 35 through verse 41, where the Lord Jesus was on the boat with his disciples. He was down to the bow of the boat, sound asleep. The storm comes. The disciples are petrified. They're worried. They're thinking, today we may die. And they rush down and awaken Jesus. Master, aren't you concerned that we may die? That's the young blood vernacular of that text. Jesus was in full peace because he's in total control. And that's what he wants in our lives is to allow him through us to be in total control of our lives and our hearts and what we're doing and saying. John fourteen twenty seven. Jesus says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And yet we are fearful so often of what tomorrow might bring. Notice first and secondly, we find this peace is, number one, supernatural. Secondly, the peace is sure. And then the thirdly, the peace is secure. Notice the peace is supernatural, which passeth all understanding. Passes, surpasses, transcends all understanding. Have you ever seen the body that faced with all kinds of dilemmas and problems and difficulties, yet you can talk with them. There seems to be a total serenity. They're not worried. They're not anxious. They're not fretful. They're just simply waiting on God. It may be a job. It may be a health scenario. It may be the death of a loved one. Whatever it may be, but they're simply in a state of total serenity. And you look at it and you say, wow, that is supernatural. That is not natural for that person in that condition, in that position, to be in a total state of peace and tranquility. That's because it is is supernatural. It goes beyond comprehension. Peace and tranquility and the peace of heart in the midst of trials and tribulations and troubles can be understood by the world simply because it's a supernatural work of God through the Holy Spirit in your life and in mine. Peace. How to find peace? It's supernatural. It's sure. Notice the scripture says in that seventh verse, shall keep shall, not maybe, not possibly, not occasionally, but shall keep. It's in the positive. It is absolute assurance. Shall. It's positive. It's guaranteed by God. Shall keep, and that word keep is tereo. It means to encircle. It means to uh, have the work of the Holy Spirit simply encircling our hearts and bringing about that peace. We'll have that divine commitment from God that there's that peace and only holy God to do that. And it's only when we have that worry and anxiety that we turn over to Him, we bring it to Him with prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. He'll give that supernatural peace. It's sure. It is absolute sure. Shall keep. And may I remind us again with that word keep? That's the security of it. That's the security of it. It is the little word tereo. It means to garrison about. It means to have a sentry on the lookout. It means to watch over. It means to guard. It means to surround and protect. And here the promise is that that peace is going to surround, garrison about, and absolutely keep our hearts and our minds. I don't know about you, but it should cause a Christian to rejoice and the realization of what we have from God committed in His Word that we fail to take advantage of, that we fail to go to, that we fail to call upon Him for, that we fail to praise Him for. Notice not only the peace committed, but notice the pathway conveyed in that seventh verse. It says there, through, that word through is the little Greek word, dia, dia, D-I-A, means by way of. How do we have this peace? It is through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the gateway. He is the avenue. He is the uh, doorway to that peace that we so need in society today. An individual without Christ, an individual that's never said yes to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, has not that opportunity to go to God in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving and having our hearts garrisoned about by the peace of God. It's the peace of God that can only come through the Lord Jesus Christ. The world and psychology and all of the material goods cannot provide peace, but Jesus Christ can. I've seen some of the most miserable people on the face of the globe that have all this security, as we'd call it, in material things that you'd ever think possible. And yet they're the most insecure, the most miserable, anxious people that I've met. 
those that have the great resources financially, those that have the mindset somehow, some way, that I have, uh, I'm a self-made person. I pull myself up by my own bootstraps. I have all that is need. I don't have a need for anything. They're internally miserable. They're always concerned that somebody's going to take what they've got. <laughs> They're always concerned about what they might lose tomorrow. They're always worried about looking at that ticker as it goes up or down on the stock market. They don't have the real peace that God has promised us through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the pathway that peace is conveyed through the way, the uh, dia, the way, the doorway of Jesus Christ. So not only the prerequisite of peace revealed and the prescription of peace recorded and the promise of peace reminded, but I want you to notice in verse 8 and 9, I want you to notice in those two verses, the plan of peace reviewed. The plan of peace reviewed. Notice the program communicated. Notice what the Apostle Paul says. Finally, brethren, by the way, if you ever hear a preacher says finally, don't pay any attention to it at all. <laughs> finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. I want you to notice it's a text, a part of this text, but it's a verse that's rarely, rarely exegeted, explained, and grasped from the Christian heart and the Christian mind. Notice what the Scripture is saying. The program communicated, think. That word think means to ponder, to meditate, to dwell on these things. And Satan would have us to ponder, to meditate, and to dwell on everything but these things that's found in that eighth verse. These things that we need to place our mind and our heart on. In fact, in Romans chapter 12, the scripture is very, very clear as to what we ought to do. Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by dia through the renewing of your mind, that you may prove that which is good, honorable, kelos, honorable before God, and acceptable and perfect, mature, will of God. Listen to what the Scripture is saying here in this text in Philippians, the 8th verse of the 4th chapter. Listen to what the Scripture is saying. Our minds we need to have, as in Philippians 2 says, the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, that thought it not robbery, etc., etc. That is the continuing voice that we need to keep on letting the mind of Christ. The greatest conflict we find, the greatest battle that's waged today is not political, it's not social, it's not economic. It is the greatest battle, and that is the battle for the mind and the heart and the thinking of the child of God. It is the battle to control the mind. Daily we are bombarded with hundreds of commercials by way of television and the handheld devices. <laughs> Have you ever noticed the way they advertise cars today? They never show you the engine. They never talk about uh, what horsepower it's got. They never tell you it's uh, uh, straight six, straight four, V6, V8, or whatever it may be. Never say anything about that. Don't say anything about the gear ratio, nothing. And all of the old car ads of yesteryear, they would tell you all of those things mechanically about what makes that car so good. What you see today is a rock and roll sound uh, in the background and the car zipping across the uh, screen as it slides doing the figure eight on a desert sand someplace. And it tells you how you can get that car for just $489 a month or next 92 years <laughs> they're selling you an image you're buying an image and it's because of the subtlety of Satan working in the mind and saying this is the car that you need in fact there's one of the ambulance chasers on television one of the law firms that says we're going to get you what you deserve the mindset is we're going to get you all that we can get by way of the court and by way of the law, all that you deserve. Telling you, it's subtly in your mind, you deserve it. It's yours. Let's go and get it. And that's the heartbeat and the mindset and the attitude of the commercials and the advertisers that control the product sale by the mind. Politicians want to control your mind. My email account gets blown up each day. On the three or four different email accounts, I get about 150 to 200 emails every day. 99% of them I just have to zip out, zip out. 
But I'm finding more and more because of social media now deplatforming many of the conservative so-called politicians. They found now that by email is the way they can communicate. Every one of them is telling me, and I'm sure telling you, telling me and telling you that if we'll just send the money, they're going to change this problem in Washington. They're going to make everything right, and everything is going to be done, but they're operating on the mind. You want what's best. You want us to go back to where it was. You want conservative thought. You want conservative action. You want to remove Joe Biden, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, yes, yes. They're controlling the mind and say then, get, give us a check. Give us your char charge, car charge card number, and we can take care of all these problems. It's operating on the mind. It is Satan that is after the mind of an individual. The politicians want that. The com uh, commercials are trying to sell that. The mindset today with the COVID-19 is working on the mind, causing one to be fearful of tomorrow. Let me just pause for a moment on that subject. Is COVID-19 a deadly pathogen? pathogen? Yes, it is. Is COVID-19 something that I ought to be afraid of? No, it's not. Let me just tell you this, if you've not heard me recite it before. In all of the deaths, medical malpractice, automobile wrecks, pneumonia, average annual flu, et cetera, et cetera, the total number of deaths in 2019 and the total number of deaths including COVID in 2020, almost identical number identical number and yet people are petrified that they're going to die from covid we're going to die one day every one of us i'm here to tell you there's not one under the sound of my voice to get out of this world alive except a spirit man that's going to one day be up up and away in the sudden seizure that's called the rapture of the church we're going to be out of here but they are operating on the heart of fear, trying to cause us to be fearful. In fact, one of the consternations of the media this afternoon in watching the news, they were concerned that so many in America are unconcerned about a mask, unconcerned about future lockdowns, unconcerned about the vaccinations, and are not concerned about it. And the question by the Communist Network News anchor was, how can we get people to be more concerned that will cause them to all rush out and get the vaccine? Several states are sending the vaccines back to the feds because they say they don't need it. People are not wanting a vaccination. And now they're concerned as to why. They're wanting to control the mind. CNN, the Communist Network News, has started showing right-hand side of the screen now the number of deaths, the number of cases, and how alarming it is that there are new viruses now, new strains of the virus that's coming out. They're operating on the mind. It's Satan that wants to attack our lives through the mind and prevent us from depending on Christ and bringing our prayers and requests and petitions before him. May I remind us, the Apostle Paul is saying to the believers at Philippi, the news media, the politicians, and the commercials, etc., 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 whatever it may be in that era and today, are trying to get the, our attention by the mind. There is an attempt today to control our thinking about homosexuality and the sodomite marriages, about abortion and the so-called uh, legal, legality of abortion. They're trying to control our minds about premarital sex and transsexual movement today and the movement that's underway to legalize prostitution and drugs on a national basis. And they're doing so trying to attack us through the mind. The mind is what saves and to control and that's the reason we ought to recognize that and say no and let Christ control our lives and our emotions our hearts and our minds it's an attempt to control every view that we have today through the uh, BLM the Black Lives Matter which is a radical uh, Marxist socialist communist movement today the drugs and the euthanasia and other things drugs and drinking are permeating the hearts and the lives of people today because Satan wants to control the mind of individuals The battle is unrelenting, hour by hour, day by day, year after year. And Paul knew this. And this is the reason he talks about it in the seventh chapter of Romans. Paul dealt with this himself. Romans, the seventh chapter, verse 15 and following. Paul said, For that which I do not allow, for which, that which I do allow not, for what I do would do not, but what I hate that I do. If then I do that which would not, I would not, I consent under the law, that is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. 
For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Keep in mind, this is the Apostle Paul. He had started church after church after church. This is some 30 plus years after he had gotten saved. He has uh, basically uh, taken the globe and shaken the then known world with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is what Paul is saying. Verse 19 and following. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in the members warring against the law of my mind, against the war my mind, notice, against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He's talking about that dead man that's on his back. The Apostle Paul is saying that there is a war going on in our lives, and it's the war for the mind. And it's Christ that wants to control our mind, but it's Satan that's warring to control our mind. And the only way we can have peace that passes all understanding is knowing the Lord Jesus Christ and submitting and surrendering to Him new and afresh every day. If Satan can control our mind, he can control our action, he can control our words. And praying and reading the Bible, the mind wanders so often rather than being focused and concentrated on the Word of God. To control the mind is very serious. Isaiah 26, 3 says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. It's keeping our mind focused on Christ, keeping our mind focused on his will and his way, keeping our mind focused on what he can do and not what we can do. There is a conflict today for the concentration, the thoughts and the control of the mind which in turn will control the conduct. Our mind will control our conduct. May I tell you, that's what Satan is after in our lives. And notice the Apostle Paul says, whatsoever things are true, those are the things that are the unwavering, genuine, steadfast, and sincere. Our mind has tremendous power to control over our behavior and our conduct. Whatsoever things are honest, that is unbiased without any mixture that is honest, that is uh, Im impartial, that is fair and unbiased. Whatsoever things are just, that's talking about things that's upright, honorable, virtuous things, right toward self and right toward the Savior, respectable and worthy of God thought, God's thoughts and our minds. Whatsoever things are pure, that is unmixed, unadulterated, with no evil, untainted, pure in morals and motives. Whatsoever things are lovely, I say that's things that are unequal. A word here only in the New Testament, a term used to describe fine art and music, an attractive Christian character, peerless and excellent in that which is done, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things of good report, that is unsurpassed by anything else, that is praiseworthy, deserving, worthy, and honor and notability. That's what Paul says we need to think on. That's what the Scripture says that our hearts and our minds need to be focused on. Notice he says there, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think, dwell on these things, not on the wickedness and evil that's taking place. It's hard to talk about it. It's hard to understand. It's hard to see it. All right to understand what is taking place and what uh, Satan is doing and what God is doing and how we need to battle against it through the power of the Holy Spirit of God in our hearts and in our lives. If the peace of God is to control our lives, we must take the steps to fill our minds with that which is pure, honorable, good, and trustworthy. If there be any virtue, concept of moral excellency, if there be any praise, that's a concept of verbal, verbal communication and excellence. Think on, dwell on, concentrate, meditate on these things. Notice in that ninth verse as we close. Notice not on the program communicated, but the practical communicated. Those things which you have both learned. Notice the words now. Paul says those things that you've learned and received and heard and seen in me do. It's a pretty powerful statement. Keep in mind, Paul says, mimic me, follow me, because I follow Jesus. So Paul is saying here, 
those things that you both learned, that means personal instructions. Those things that you've received, that is the personal inculcation that's implanted in the heart and the life. And heard, that's the personal indoctrination through what's been heard. Paul's talking about what he's taught them, what he said to them, what they've learned, received, heard, and seen. That's personal illumination. Paul is saying, those instructions I've given you that's been inculcated in your heart, you've been indoctrinated in the right things, you've been illuminated through what I have taught you and shown you, he says, do them. Pretty simple instructions. Do them. Act on them. Be responsible before the Lord for them. Let there be the implementation of what you've seen in my life is what Paul is saying. It's not enough just to have concepts. It's not enough just to have the right conduct. It's not enough just to perceive something. We must practice what we've heard and seen and learned in the Scripture. It is required biblically for every child of God. Paul is saying, I'm the example. Imitate me. Follow me. Don't just talk about it, but walk it. Carry it out in your daily life. And finally, not on the program communicating the practical conduct, but I want you to notice the present commitment. The present's committed. And the God of peace shall be with you. And the God of peace shall be with you. My bride bakes a good pound cake, but she has a recipe. She's made that cake so many times the recipe's in her mind, and she can... Pour it out. But if you don't follow that recipe, you won't have a good pound cake. Recently at our son's house for his birthday get-together, his next-door neighbor had baked a pound cake. She used the same mold that my bride uses. It looked just like hers. One of our daughters in love, sitting in the family room eating a slice of the cake, she said, Dad, this is not like Mom's cake. It's not the same recipe. <laughs> the Apostle Paul gives the recipe that we're to follow, and he said, those things that you have learned to me, received from me, heard from me, seen in me, then do them. And then there's the commitment from God, and the God of peace shall be with you. That's how we find peace. That's how we eliminate worry. God promised to be with us. He said in that text, in, the, in another text in John 14, I'll always be with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And we need to understand that that peace is promised by God. Someone has said, living surpasses learning. Practice surpasses preaching. And that's the reason we ought to practice what the Apostle Paul says. We need to be anxious for nothing and start praying and praising God and pondering and meditating on his word about everything. Now, the question, how do we take this and in practicality put it to use tomorrow? How do we respond to it? It's simply we need to be obedient to what the word of God says. Need to follow what the scripture says. Not worrying about anything, but in everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, making our request known unto God. And the peace that passes all understanding shall surpass us, shall encircle us, shall protect us. I don't know about you, but that's a comforting thought to place our heads on as a pillow in the night. Would you stand, please? As we stand together, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. As the piano plays... <laughs>